Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back. So this tutorial is an update on our MVC because I want us to make a lot of websites using this MVC structure and I don't want us to always recreate the wheel uh, meaning always recreating things that we'll be using over and over. So I want us to create more functionality, improve it a little bit and then so that it's ready for use whenever we want to try and make a new website. All right. So of course the code in here is going to be available on my website so you can go to the download section. The link will be in the description. So this is where all of the downloadable files are. That's free phptutorials.com slash downloads. So you can always just click on the downloads uh, part here. And please make sure you click one of these ads here because clicking on the ads does help me out. So if you like what I do here, uh, whenever you come and download something, just make it a habit to click on something. Yeah. Alrighty then. So you find the files over here. Once I upload them, they will be here. And of course, the link will be in the description. All right. So we have this uh, MVC, which link is in the description, uh, of course. And I have it in my localhost slash MVC slash public. So this is where we are. And this is the home page. So this is all well and good. But the functions we're going to put here we will not display anything. I'll just explain step by step what we're actually doing. Okay, so if you if you remember correctly, the structure of the MVC. Um, if we go to our app here, this is where we have all the important files, and then public is where we have the public files. Now automatically when you load it, it's going to load the index.php page because that's the only PHP page that will be in the public section. However, if somebody manages somehow to get to your other section, the app folder here, they shouldn't be able to load classes directly because that might trigger errors which will give them information that is unwanted. So for example, let's try and load this uh, home page right here directly. Now, normally I'll just load in the PHP uh, file, but what if I tried to load the home.php page? So let's do that. If I go in here and do dot dot slash app slash controllers slash home dot PHP like that. Okay, this should not be allowed to happen. So if I press enter, um, controller not found. Okay, so it seems we actually, okay, so there's an error here. So there's a fatal error in the file home.php. So you see, we have managed to load this file and it's complaining that on line six, there's a fatal error because the trait called controller could not be found. So let's see what's going on here. So if on line six, uh, this trait right there, use controller, that's line eight, actually. What did it say here? On line six. Mm. Regardless, uh, this is the problem here. So if we load these controllers directly, there'll be problems and we should prevent that. Okay. Because in case this error is displayed, at least the user knows there's a controllers folder and there are PHP files there. So what we should show instead is access denied or something like that. So I've added some code in here, which I'll simply copy uh, to make sure that we speed things up. I don't want to take too long on this. All I want you to do is eventually just download uh, the, the code and then we are home and dry. So I'm just going to copy this code right here. I'll cut it instead. So what I'm going to do is go to the home page and just after the session start, I'll put something here. Okay. So this is path, the path to this file. So we're just defining a root path as the path to this file, the index file. Okay. So the reason I'm doing uh, this declaration of root path is so I can check on it. 
So DIR is, if you put two underscores like this and then DIR like that, another two underscores, this will always echo out the current path of this file that you are in when you wrote this code. And then we put this directory separator. This is a constant that simply represents whether we are using a slash like this or slash like that on the current operating system. So imagine this as a slash but the correct one depending on what system you're using. Okay, so that's why we've defined this root path here. Now, if I were to echo root path here, you would see what it will give us. So if I come back here, and this time, let me just go back to the home page, And you see, this is what it gives us. So the directory separator is this one, which shows up correctly because we're in Windows. So that's just the path. It's a constant that will make sure in case we need the root path, we have it. But at the same time, we can use that to check if this does not exist in a file. It means whoever is accessing the website at that time omitted to include the index page. So if this is not set, then the index page was never included. That way we can use that to determine whether somebody has right to access this file directly. So I have some code for that as well. So where did I put that? This right here. So I'm going to cut that. So uh, you can copy if you're typing along, just copy this as it is. You can pause the video, of course. Now what I'm going to do is go to the home.php and right at the top there, I'm going to paste that. So this one is checking. So defined is a question is like saying uh, it returns true or false if whatever constant you put here is defined yet or not. Now we define this in the index page. Now we are checking to see if it was defined. So if it wasn't, which means this returns false, the or is going to run whatever code is this side if this is false. Okay, so you can only do this if this evaluates to true or false, and it does, then you put the or, and then you tell the uh, the code to exit. And instead of just writing no direct script, uh, script allowed, this is not too much information. We just say access denied. Like that. Okay, so we just say access denied. That way they won't know whether this is from a PHP, um, this is from PHP or it's from Apache. All right, so let's try what we had tried before again. I'll refresh this and let's go forward refresh and this is what you see now instead of giving us that error it just says access denied that way we can't access a controller directly so whichever file that you don't want access directly just put this line at the very top so let's do that same thing with this one so we're going to have to put this on every single controller so we add that there so every single controller that we create we should add that as well. Now you can add this as well to the any of these core classes, like for example, app, so that nobody can access these guys directly. Um, even this one as well, if you want. So any file that you think is important, let's add to every one of them. Okay, access denied including the functions page. You never know uh, what that might bring. All right, very good. We can go to the models as well, and let's add that as well right there. The views, it's okay. I think the files in here are more important. Okay, so let's close all these files that I've opened here. Uh, except the functions file, I can leave that in. Let's close these guys. Okay, great. So that's that. And the second thing is that we need to define a minimum PHP, uh, a minimum PHP version that can be used with this MVC, because it's very possible that we may use functions that cannot run on a lower version. For example, I'm going to show you. Um, where is this? In here, we'll be using things like mixed. This thing here cannot run in uh, version seven, for example. 
So I'm going to grab this here and then cut that. And then we're going to go to the index.php there and right about just after session start, uh, we're going to add that there like so. Okay. So this one will determine what the valid PHP version is. So the minimum version is version 8.0. Now you can always change this in case you want to run it on a smaller version. This is just so when you deploy it and somebody tries to run this, they will be reminded that their version is lower than uh, the recommended one. So we'll put this as a reminder. So in case we use a lower version, it's going to say your PHP version must be, and then it's going to grab the same minimum version that we've set. This function PHP version just returns the PHP version that you are using right now. So if you run this, you echo this, you see the version I am running right now. So we can do that like so just so you can see what I'm talking about. And let's go back to our home page. I'll do back like so. And you see I'm running 8.12. So that's definitely uh, higher than eight. So that's why it will run just fine. Okay, so unfortunately I can change the, uh, the value of this to check if uh, this is running. So your PHP version must be, and they need to show what the version must be or higher to run this app. Your current version is, and they need to show you PHP version there. Okay, great. So now that we've done this, we need to change one fundamental thing as well, which is namespaces. So we now need to start using namespaces, but let's leave that for last because it's a little bit more, maybe a little bit more complex. So let's go back to here. I want to add some functions. So the functions we have are only three. There's this one, there's the escape, and then there's the redirect. But let's add a few more functions that are usually useful when I'm doing things myself. Now there's this uh, function right here. So I'll just copy this guy. Actually, let's just cut that guy here. And let's put this one first. Let's put it right there. Now I don't need to put this here. I can put this over there, no problem, like so. So this is a function here and we are running it immediately. We load the page. So what this function does is it checks for extensions, PHP extensions. Now, usually when I'm doing these tutorials, I find people say, uh, some, someone may say, uh, I have an error which says something like image create um, something like this image create is, or it says unknown function. For example, it will say something like unknown function and then image create in the error that is. So this is usually caused because the GD library is not enabled on their system. So what this function does is it checks if the extensions we need are actually active before we run the program. So in here, there's required extensions. So GD is required. If they have not activated it, it's going to give us an error and we can test this actually. So what I'm going to do is control shift D like so. So whenever you want to add another extension, just add its name here. Maybe there's MySQL is required, right? That's an extension that's required MySQL. We can add that there as well like that. Okay. So um, to check if an extension is loaded, you put the text in this function, extension loaded. This returns true or false. This is a PHP function. And so if I put something like extension loaded and I put GD there, it's going to tell me if GD is actually loaded in your PHP currently. But the way I've put it like this is it will go through this loop. So this is an array we created. So you can add as many extensions as you want. And then this one will store the ones that are not loaded. So as it does it for each loop, it's going to check to see which ones are not loaded uh, that are required and they need to put them there. And then if it's not empty, meaning some are not loaded, it's going to write something like 
uh, here let's use show okay so show which is this function right here so the show will be please load the following extensions in your php file and then it will show that list it will implode that uh, array and show you that so to give an example of this right now gd is active on my system i'm going to refresh and you see there's no problem but let's go to apache here my um, server what i'm going to do is try and configure uh, not mysql but apache so i'll use the php.ini file and then if i go to all the extensions here extension equals to so let's go down and try to find this extension module name this is just an example it tells you how you supposed to save these guys so for example extension mysql so this one is required as well right so let me just copy this and let's add it here just so we have two of these guys i'll paste there like so uh, very nice and let's go back where is our um, yes there we go so let's go again um, there's a list of extensions right here so as you can see sometimes the extension will have a semicolon at the beginning which means it's deactivated these ones are active so maybe we need curl as well maybe we need ftp so currently the extensions that exist are these ones let's curl there let's just add it there and um, what else uh, gd is right there uh, maybe file info we do use this as well um, where is this one is a troublemaker especially when you are doing um, when you're dealing with code igniter the int l should be active let's just put it there uh huh okay i'm up nope uh, mb string x if we do use this uh, when we are dealing with um, uh, images we sometimes get data through x if data uh, let's put mysql is already there let's put mb string so the best thing to do is you check your php extension while you are working on a project and then you look at all the uh, the extensions that are actually active at this time like mysql or pdo we need that as well definitely so let me duplicate it and add it here so you look at all of those that are active and then just put them as required because you never know pdo sqlite we're not using sqlite but who knows um using this um mvc we might decide to use sqlite for example if we are creating a point of sale and uh I don't even know what this one is what this one does uh dot net eh, i am not sure anyway uh soap we d we haven't used soap in here which is like curl uh, but uh, who knows we may want to use those but it's not a required one so whatever you activate here just add it to that list so what i want to do is show you an example for example if we do not for some reason we haven't activated uh, mysql let's say extension pdo i want to put a semicolon here so that it's uh, deactivated and let's try another one let's try exif as well so i'm going to save this and then i will restart my apache and then start again so there we go switch off and on and now if i refresh my page let me zoom out and refresh my page so it shows me this message please load the following extensions in a pn php.ini file uh, pdo mysql and exif so as you can see it can detect uh, which ones are supposed to be open but are not so let me save that let's get back to business stop apache and start it again let's try again okay so everything is good now so our extensions are working so this is what this function does so i'm going to uh, of course you can have the code but you can copy it here just pause the video and you can type it in case for some reason you don't have the code or you can't get the code from the website 
All right, so that does it. That's one thing. Now let's keep going and add some more functions. So there's also this function called get image. So this one makes it easy for us to get an image. So let me grab this, cut this out of here and let's go down here. Now we can start putting things down here. So let's go here. Now, if it's up to you, you can actually label these, um, put comments here like, um, check if image exists. Okay. Uh, let's see, load image. If not exist, load placeholder. Oops. So please do comment, uh, do add comments on these things. That way it's easier to remember what the function is doing. But this is the function right here. So the function is get image. I use this a lot. Now you will notice that I'm writing, this is called um, type hinting. So I'm telling it that I'm expecting a mixed value in here. It may be a string or it may be something else. Uh, it may be a no object, but I think it's better to keep it to a string. So just put a string there. In case we don't get a string, then, ah, no, let me leave it. I think I had problems. That's why I moved it to fixed, to mixed. Okay, so file name, usually a string, but sometimes you may give it a no or empty, and it should be able to handle that, I guess. And then here, this is a string. I don't know if you can actually do this and say no like that. Does that work? I have no idea. Let me try and refresh if I don't get any errors. Well, look at that. <laughs> it seems this actually works. Hey, I'll check this out. If it does, then I'll, I'll give you guys an update uh, where you can say it can either be a string or a null like that. Maybe it works. I don't know. So here we're expecting a string of type post. So what I've done here, this thing checks to see if the file name you've, you've given it exists. And if it does, this is just for images, then it will return the path to that image, which includes the root path here. Because remember in our MVC system, we require images to have an absolute path and that's what root is, the absolute path. So it will put that in advance for you, which is kind of nice. And then here we have a type, either post or it can be a user. So the reason I added this is you may want to have a different placeholder for an image let's say oh by the way if it doesn't find the file it's going to return a placeholder so one of the placeholder is user and instead of webp let's try jpeg instead like that so i'll have two placeholders in my public assets um thingy here one will be called user.jpg because that's a placeholder for a profile for example and then there will be no image placeholder for posts, for example, if an image is missing. So that's what we are doing here. So if the file exists, return the path. If it doesn't, check if type was set to user, then return the user uh, placeholder. If not, we return the, the remainder, the one we use for posts there. So I'm going to need placeholders. So you can just Google placeholders here. Uh, no big deal, but uh, let's see. I'll wait here. So in the images folder, in public assets images, I actually put two images. There's this one. So you can just Google any placeholder that you want. This one is just no image available. The other one is a, oh, it's a WebP file. So I guess that's why I put WebP after all. So let me change that back. Now you can put a JPEG file, just put the JPG to make sure it's the right file extension. But let me do this. Let me do open containing folder. Ah, so I can't even view the WebP file. Oh, there we go. I can actually view it. So it's just an icon of a user, like a placeholder here. All right. Let me see if I go to large icons. Ah, there we go. There we go. So it can show you this is what it is. So user WebP. So it's part of the project. Okay, so this is what this does. So good. At least those problems are sorted for us. Let's go down here. Now, this one is for pagination. So let me cut this 
and let's put it here after this one so here I'm just going to say uh, get pagination links or we can say returns that's more programming language it returns some pagination links so all this thing does is it returns an array so if you put full colon array there it means the function must return an array like that you can remove this if you want uh, but it just makes you a bit more strict to add that so that you don't forget and return something else so we set the vars ver um, array here we create an array called vars and then we add items to that array and then we return it this is all we're doing so here what i want to do is i want to return uh, one item called page and this one will be the page number so what this one does is it checks the get variable in the url to see if page exists if it exists get that value and return it if it doesn't let's set page to one we just assume we're on page one and then the same page we make sure we convert the value to an integer by casting it as an int like this that way in case somebody had typed in page is equal to no then that will be changed to a number instead that way we don't have problems when trying to use it then there will be previous page now all we need to do with previous page is do a minus one we say page minus one right but sometimes if the page is page one and we do minus one it will take us to page zero which will not be ideal so instead here we're going to ask the question if vars page is less than or equal to one then just return one as the previous page so we just re, uh, previous page will still be one page one because we can't go lower than that if it's greater than one however just return the page number minus one okay great so next page this one we don't care we can go to page one million it's not a problem so we just say current page plus one so we'll use this for pagination to create links to our pagination that's all okay then let's go to uh, I think I may actually shift this to a pager class so in future I'm going to add a pagination class I don't have it yet but I will so maybe we'll use that okay let's go to the next one and this one is a message so let me grab this cut this and put it here so message function what this message function does is it saves or displays a message to the user okay so this is the message function i'll show you how to use this function it may look a little bit complex now but what it does is we have message is equal to no and uh, clear is equal to true or false so this is a boolean so here i can do boo like that to make sure okay this only accepts true or false and then the message can be mixed i don't know uh, a mixed value actually no this can be just needs to be a string that's all and then uh, the return value it return false return message yeah so the make the value of return is mixed so I'll just leave it open there so um, this is a bit ahead of our time so we're going to create a session um, we're going to create a session class so this is what it's going to have so that's why we are doing this but don't mind there's a session class in there and then what we're doing is because the session holds information that we can use over several pages so in there I'm going to have a set function so I'll show you this uh, session class later so essentially what this function is doing is it checks if you give it a message okay if you give it a message it's going to save it 
So here, this one is just setting a message in the, this is like uh, setting a value in the session variable. This is all it's doing here. So don't, don't mind this complex um, function. We'll create this function. I'll show you this function. Now, if somebody did not provide a message in uh, a string for a message, it means you want to read the message. So this function both writes a message and you can also use it to read a message if there's any. And so if there's no message given, then we just check, uh, we get a message from the, we check if there's a message in the session, then we grab that message and then return it. But then if this clear was sent to, was set to true, then we would tell it to also clear the message from the session variable. So this is what it's doing. First of all, check if a message was given. If it was, save it into the session. If no message was given, then it means the user wants you to read. And so it's going to go ahead and read the message. And if clear was set, that message will also be deleted before it's returned. Simple and straightforward. Now you may be asking, why do we need this function? This function is for, let's say, you are in your admin section and you edit a user. This is where you save the message to say, you, uh, user edited successfully. So that's what we're going to be using this for simple small messages, especially in the admin section. All right, so I'm going to skip this one for now. Let's go to these guys here that are much easier. So there's old values here. So there's old checked, old value, and old select. All right. Okay. So let me grab these guys. They're all related. I'll cut these guys and put them here in our real function. Okay. So what this function does is, let's say you, um, you are trying to sign up and uh, there's a select button there. Uh, let's say you have to choose whether a male or female. And then you select an option. But once the page refreshes, you find that there are errors. And so it doesn't actually save the data. So what this function does is it shows you, it retains that old select. So let's say whatever uh, selection the user had made, it maintains that. So that's what old select does. But old value is for, they all do the same thing. It's just that old value is for text inputs. This one is for select inputs. So whenever you save and there are errors, it will show you back the information you had typed. Let's say it says wrong email or password. It will still show you the email that you had uh, entered instead of an empty um, input box. So same with this. This is for checked check boxes. This is for text inputs and this is for select inputs. That's all it does. So let's go, um, let's look at what this does here. So old value, there's a key here and a default value. So to use this, you would go in your input. Let's say, for example, you have an input like this, and then you have a value like that. So that value thing, you put old uh, value in there, like so the function. So what the function does is there's a key here. You tell it that uh, this one is for the email, for example. And so what happens is that if I click save and then there are errors, it will check inside the post variable. If this key, if there's an item with a key of email in there, then what it would do is it's going to return that item and put it as the value for your input. So that way, anything in the post is returned back to the correct input when the page refreshes. Otherwise, if it doesn't have anything in the post, just return a default value. So here I may put a default value, like in case the user hasn't typed in an email yet, let's put an email of example uh, at email.com, something like this. So this will be shown in the value, but once you type something and you click uh, save, it will prioritize whatever you had typed instead of putting that. So this is all it's doing here. So now I added a mode here, right? For whether you want to use the post or because sometimes you may want to get values from the get variable instead of the post variable instead. So this mode switches that to instead of looking at the post to look at the get. 
So the get is good for when somebody typed a search because usually that information is saved in the get variable. So we can use uh, the, um, once they get their results because the page will refresh to get those results. And once the page refreshes, then they can still see what search term they used to get those results. So that result, uh, they, they, uh, the text, the search text they had typed will be in there. So hopefully this is understood what these guys are doing. So I wanted to write uh, some comments, but feel free to write the comments on your own. So it's exactly the same thing happening on the check. The only difference is that it returns the text checked like that instead of returning a value. Same thing here, selected is selected. Here I had left some spaces, which was wiser, I guess. So let me just leave some spaces here because uh, just in case there are no spaces left when adding these, using these functions. Okay, so maybe let's put something like uh, displays um, input values after a page refresh. Now you can write this in your own language that you understand. That way you know exactly what these things do. All right, great. So we are almost there. Um, yep, we are almost there. So these remaining functions are a bit complex, but I'll explain uh, in a moment. So there's get date here. Now, just like we have get image, we have get date. So this thing just returns a user, a user readable date. So when you have a date, like for example, in uh, you have 2022 dash 10 dash uh, 28, like this, usually this is what the date will look like, but this is going to convert it to something like 28th um, October and then a comma 2022. So this is converted to this uh, using this. So what we are doing is we're using the date function and then we grab whatever date it is. We're expecting that the date will be something like this. Uh, too many twos there. Something like that. And then we convert it to a, we do a string to time to convert it to a Unix, is it called a Unix timestamp or something? Uh, number of seconds. And then after that, because this is what the date function requires, and then we format it differently instead of this, we format it into something like that. So that's what this function does. Okay, great. Now, finally, these babies here. So first of all, skip this one a bit. Let me go to remove images from content. So very important function here. Now, in most of our my tutorials, I'm going to be using a, uh, a WYSIWYG editor. So let me show you the WYSIWYG editor I'm talking about. This one is Summernote because it's free. That's what I'll be using. It looks something like this, where the user, instead of just a normal text input, the user can type something and then format that text. So maybe you can put bold, you can make it a header one like that. So what's happening here is that in the background, it's creating HTML code that changes the properties of this text. So if you click on the code view here, you see that it adds an H1 tag, a bold tag, and so on, and a paragraph tag in the background. So that's what it's doing here. So we'll be using a lot of this, especially when we do things like um, blogs and so on. Now the problem comes in when you add an image. So for example, if you allow users to add pictures here, I'm going to browse for a picture and let me add, actually, before I do this, let me delete whatever is in here so that it's completely empty. And then I'll add an image. Okay, let's add any image here. So there is the image in the text editor. Unfortunately, I can't uh, really increase the width, the height here, because this is on their website. Now, here it looks like an image, but if we look at the code, this is what's happening. 
The problem is that the image is saved as part of the text. You see this text here. This is the image. The image is saved in the data file name here. And this is the image name. But then there's this text right here. So it's converted, the image is converted to base64. So if you look here, this is the string that represents the entire image. It's quite long because it's a whole image. But what I want you to see here is uh, this part that says data, image, and then it tells you it's a JPEG. This is the image type. It's a data type, image JPEG, and then it's saved as base64. And then there's a comma here. And then the actual image here saved as base64. Now, the, the problem, the the problem here is that if somebody uploads a heavy image, maybe a, an image that's one megabyte, because one megabyte is too big for a website for any image. The problem is you can't resize this image in its format like this. So instead, what will happen is this image will be saved in the database. Now we can't have this. Uh, it's not advisable to save images into your database. You have to save them to the file system. And in the database, you simply save the file path to that image. Okay. So this function in here, what it does is it scans this content. So as long as you use this text editor here to save your data, you can run that function to scan the contents that it has sent and then remove all images that are here. So it's just going to check whatever images are added as base64. It's going to gather this data, convert them back to normal images and save them using this data type here. And then at the end here, it's going to grab the file name and label that as the file name. As you can see here, it's saved. So this is all it's doing. And then it will replace this image with a link to the file path itself. Instead of having all this data in here, it will add a link instead. So this is what this function does. So I can explain this a little bit. So this is the content itself uh, from that input. And then this is the folder where it's going to save. So you can change where the default folder to save this, but I leave it as uploads because that's the folder we want created. So this part, what it does is it checks if the folder exists. If it does not, it will create the folder, give it permission and then put an empty PHP file in there, just in case somebody wanted to check your, your uploads folder, they'll find uh, it won't actually show them the list. Now, the reason we do this is because this folder is in the public folder, so it's accessible to anyone. So we put an index.php there so that when they try to access it, instead the empty page will load. So you can put some text in the empty page and say, access denied if you want, but eh, blech, this is fine. You can put the content here. Just say something like access denied, uh, like that. Okay, if you want. Oops. So uh, that's what this is doing. Wait a minute. Did I copy it? No, I did not. All right. So that's what this part does. And then this one, remove images from content. So this just does a preg match. So it searches for any image tags. That's what it's doing. Every image tag will be saved inside matches here. And then we create a new content uh, variable. So we save the old content to new content first so that we swap it over. And then we start looping through any matches that we have found because it's possible maybe there are no matches. And then here we're going to use the image class but for now, I'm going to remove this because we really, um, hmm. Okay, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there for now. We may need to actually resize these images. So the image class is for resizing the image. Now you will notice that I'm using slash core slash image. That's because we will be using namespaces. So we'll leave it there. And then for each, so what it does here is loop, loop through all the images. And then in that image, it will, any results that we get, we loop through them and then grab just the contents of the, that are in the source of that image. So once we grab those, then we check for the data file name to save as our file name. And then once we loop, we remove that data part and then save it as uh, 
the file. So the file name is here. We put it in the folder and then we'll save it as image underscore. And then we put a, a hashed version of a random number there so that the, the image is random. Okay. And then we put the best name there. So this will make the image um, the image file name quite long, but that's okay that to avoid repetition. Now, if you don't want the files to have this random generated text, you can just remove this part like so, and it's going to survive just fine in case you don't like that. And then now the new content, we're going to replace each image from the new content and replace its <clears throat> first of all, we save the file as base64, and then we replace the source with the file name instead. Okay, and then finally, we resize the image. Now, if you don't want to resize the image, just remove this reference to image class. You can delete it and delete uh, the reference at the top here as well. Where is, where did we initialize it? Right here. You can remove that and remove this. In case it gives you problems, you don't want to resize, uh, you can remove that because that class may give you problems sometimes. So then we return the new content. This is all we're doing. So that's that function. Now, this other function is a complement to this one as well. This one is delete images from content. So what I would do here is just to show you, you can pause the video here and copy it in case you are typing along so that you see everything just pause the video and type along same thing with this delete images from content so what this does is uh when you edit your post which had which has the same uh, input as this one you find that there will be um images that do not exist anymore so because remember that it has replaced uh, the first time you saved, it replaced all the sources with actual file names. So what this does is that it checks to see if in that content, because what will happen is sometimes you're editing the content, you delete this image. Let's say you delete this image and add a different one entirely. So once you save, this image will have no actual reference. So what will happen is it's going to check if the image is saved on the file is no longer part of the content it will remove or the link to it was removed then it's going to delete that file on the drive itself so that's what it's doing here any that are found delete okay so content content and then on the other side compare old to new delete compare the old to new and delete from the old what isn't in the new okay so it's making a comparison like um let's say you had saved um you had saved this image right and then you replaced it with another one so once you save there's a new image in there of course it's going to save that image to the file but the problem is that there's that old image which you deleted in here you removed it from the content so you don't need it anymore but it's still on your drive so to keep uh, instead of adding images that are not needed on the website in the files there, it's going to look for an image that was in the old version before saving to, to the, in the old row uh, that you saved in the database. It will look for all those images in there that are not there in the new one that you saved and then delete them from the drive. So that's what this other part does here. So I added some pointers here to see what exactly is happening, but you can go through the code if you want to understand. So this is what these two uh, guys are doing. But then there's this one here, add root to images. Okay, let me go here. All right. So you can pause it to copy the code as well. So add root to images, what it simply does is it looks into the content now imagine you, because remember with this MVC system, every image must have root at the beginning. It must have an absolute path. Now the problem here is we, we don't want to save absolute paths to the database. And the reason is simple. When you are 
testing your system, you test it on localhost. So if you include the localhost in saving to your database, it means when you move it to a www, those images will be linking to your localhost, which will be a problem. So we put relative paths in the database so that whether we change our domain name or you move your website to another domain name, it won't matter. Those images will adapt. Now, the problem is because of our MVC system, we can't put relative paths on images. So what we do is temporal, tempor for a temporal period, we add root to the images. So that's when we, we are displaying them in this. So let's say I save this. I, I save this and what it does is it grabs all the data, saves to an image to, to the... Um, it replaces the data with an actual link, which is a relative link. What this means is that the next time I reload the page to actually see my content in here, it won't display. It will display an empty field because the link is relative. But you can run that content through this, which will add root to all images that are in there, and then they will display correctly. So once we start actually making content is when you're going to see how well these functions work or what exactly they do. So I'm just going to grab them here. These are the last functions, cut from there, and then put them in here. All right. So you can put comments as you wish here. So here I'm just going to say uh, deletes images from a from text editor content. I don't know if this is adequate information, but you can edit it as you wish. So let me grab this, copy that. Let me go to here. Um, converts images. from base 64 to hmm, hmm. converts images from text editor content to actual files. Well, like I said, uh, put what makes more sense to you here in the text. So this one just add, adds um, converts image paths to absolute from relative to absolute. Okay, that's that there. Very cool. All right, so let me f explain the final one that's remaining this function right here. On this function, um, what we want to do is we want to be able to run this function called URL and then get a key, and then the key will return. Um, what we want from the URL. So for example, we may have a URL where it says something like uh, the page is products and then it's slash um, books slash maybe 45 or something like this. So this is a URL where the page is products, the section is books, and then book number 45. So in this case, if I want to grab any part of the URL, I should be able to do that using this URL function. So in case I forget, um, because I've given them names, the first one is page, the second one is a section or a slug sometimes, and the last one is could be the action, and then the other one ID. So the reason why it's an action here, it could be something like edit and then slash 45. So you can have products page in the section of books and you want to edit that and then edit number 
book number 45 or this could be admin section most likely so admin section and then the book section and then we're going to edit uh, number 45 or it could be delete here so this represents the action you want to do and then the id now sometimes it may not always be the action uh, it may be something else so what i've done is instead you if you don't know what name the item you want is on you can simply put a number this one is zero one two three so that's why you have zero one two three like that to grab the items in there so i end at three because usually there are only four items in the url that are this significant after this it's better to use get variables for example like page is equal to five something like that so we use get variables after that to avoid too much complication so the only thing we need now is this app function that's going to return uh, the url and whatever wherever this is now instead of this is a code from a different project I had, but let's repurpose it to our project here. So I'm going to go to app here because we already have this split URL function right here. So it's a private function that says uh, split URL and then it returns a split URL, uh, which is great. But what we can do is let's add another function here that does exactly, that grabs the split URL and puts it in its um separate items here so hmm, because the problem is actually there's no real problem this is very little code so um, let me just grab this it's very small i thought it was quite big that way i wanted it to be in the same place but doesn't really matter the split url can be done right here so what i would do is we'll grab this so whenever we make a request it can do the splitting in real time so we say url is equal to get the url in case it's empty just put home there and then let's do it let's explode and then instead of returning url we are going to um it's going to create an array of items like those items i had shown here and the the it's going to be something like this wait a minute uh, oh yeah it's an array so it's going to have memory location of zero one two so here it would be easy to say return url zero like that so let me just grab all of these parts here and replace them with that like so okay and uh, this actually solves the problem pretty well so if for example i say url i want the page the current page so it's going to say okay key is equal to page let me return the first item in there or if you say url zero that the case will be zero and it will return the first item same thing here one two and three or if you write i want the action it's going to look for location number two and assume that's where the action is all right why do i keep saving forceful habit okay so let me grab this part here um why did i leave that <laughs> shouldn't have left that but no big deal uh, let me put i like to leave these guys at the bottom here so let me grab let me put this here just make sure you don't put it inside another function so be careful with that so this one returns uh url variables Okay, great. Uh, this is nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All righty then. Now, the reason why we're grabbing these items from get URL is the same reason we did that in the app because that's where we are saving them. So hopefully that's not confusing. Let me grab this, check which PHP extensions. Uh, this was supposed to be right at the, on this one right 
right there. All right. Okay, so looks like we've upgraded these. These are the functions we'll be using the most. All right. Now let's go to classes. Let's add some new classes that we can use later on. So the first class we're going to add. Now every these classes that we'll be using, uh, we can put them in the core uh, folder. But the problem with the core folder is it means actually these are required so we are better off putting them in the core folder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually yes okay so uh any models or any classes that you get from other users you can put them in here but then uh core classes that come with the uh, software you can put them in here but because we'll be using <clears throat> excuse me these ones a lot I think we'll put them in the core folder so we're going to be using namespaces okay so to remember to add namespaces now here is one of those um, wait a minute let me ch let me change this from this like so and put that there okay good so let me remove this part here so this is the session class now instead of us using session directly like typing session like that whenever we want to add something to the session instead of doing this we're going to create a class called session which will handle all that. Now there's some advantages to actually using a class instead of just directly. Uh, it means you can easily change things when you want to. So let's look at what this one contains. Now in here, if you notice, I'm using a namespace because we're going to start using namespaces with everything. So we're going to add everything that's in here. We'll have a namespace of core. If it's a class within here, it will have that namespace now the reason why is because in case you want to create your own class named session it won't be a problem because you can just put it in a different namespace so the reason for using namespaces is because for example here we have the home controller at some point we may want a home model okay even a user model here we may want a user page so we can't do that because it's it's going to say the class already exists here so to avoid that we put things in different namespaces these ones will be in the model namespace now you don't have to name the namespaces uh, with the folder names no I'm just naming that for convenience so you can name put them in any namespace name that you choose but I'll put them in the namespace the, to match the folder so that it's easier to remember okay so here we go now I can't put this here because namespace should be the first thing uh, at the top there so anything you put should come after this those are the rules and then we create a class called session now this function here is a private function because it's only called by other functions that are inside this class not from outside so what this one does is just checks if the session is not started yet and then start it. That's all it's doing here. So if the session hasn't started, do the session start. That's all it does. So this is why every function calls it just to make sure that the session is started before we try to run anything. So this one puts data in the session. So we say function set. So we use a function called set that we've created to set the data. So for example, if you want to save um, <clears throat> you want to save data in your session, you normally do something like this. You say session and then you give it a key name, whatever key is it is equal to uh, some value out here, like so. Right? So now if you have a lot of items to add, you have to type them one by one like this. But we can use this set function because it's a separate function to actually save an array so if I want instead I can save an array instead of a key here um, 
instead of setting a key, I can pass in an entire array and then it will just loop through the array and add the items to the session. Now, usually the items in the session are put in the app. Um, that's where I add them so that if I want to delete all variables from my app, I can simply delete from this app key like so. So this just makes things more organized. Instead of just putting directly in the session variable, uh, I can put them in the app variable. Everything I use in here will go there. So now if you want this changeable from app to something else, maybe you have different, uh, you can, you have different projects to run. You can put something here and say something like public, um, main key, I don't know, uh, is equal to, and then let's save that as app like so. That way you can change it when you want. If you want to change it to something else, uh, so I'm going to grab here, you can name it anything you want, main key. Uh, so let me remove this, this is not part of the code. So any reference to app here, I will select all of that and replace with main key. Actually, it has to be this main key. So I'm going to do that and say this main key, like so. Oops, force we have it. Okay, so that way we can always change that uh, key if we want to. So this is all it does. It just sets a value. If the value is an array, it will look through the array and put values one by one in there. So simple and straightforward. If it's just a normal key, then it's going to um, just put it there directly. And then get is just for reading. So you send in a key and if the key is not found, if the item is not found, you can specify a default value that you want it to return. So uh, when you're dealing with session directly, you may want to echo out and say something like echo session like this. Uh, and then maybe there's a key named John in there, but this will cause an error if this does not exist, right? Now, instead of having to put if not exist on every, if is set on every code, uh, we'll just use the get function, which will check if the thing is set, if it is return that data. If not, return a default value, which may be just an empty string, or you can specify an empty value. So in our case, we're just going to do something like session, get, and then we tell it what key we are looking for exactly. Maybe we are looking for John, like that. And then we'll put another item here and say, if we don't find John, return the value as Mary. So you can do things like this. Alrighty then. So this is for getting values. And this one is for the, this one is for the authentication, but I think we probably don't need it here because, um, I don't know. I think it's better to create our own authentication later on instead of hard coding it, but eh, maybe, maybe we can leave it. Uh, user role, let's see. I'm torn about this. I'm not really sure. I think let's remove it. So this is for user data. I think we can create. Okay, I, I'm not really sure here, but we will be using these most of the time. So maybe let's let's just duplicate this. I'll say main key instead of main key. It will be user key. Uh, this one will be user. So inside app, we save our. Uh, inside the session, we save the user information of the currently um, uh, logged in user inside the user key, which is right here. So I'll remove this, all references to user. Oh, it's quite extensive, hey? Eh? Oh, except that one. But anyway, I've already done it. So I'll just do, replace it with this user key and let's do that. So it has replaced everywhere else, but here I need the original, which is user like so. I had selected that by mistake. 
Okay, so auth here. So what we'll do here is authenticate a user. So all we are doing is grabbing the role of the user in the database and then adding it to the session uh, inside user. And then we add the user role there. All right, so the logout simply deletes that data. And then this one just checks to see if a user is logged in. So is logged in is the question and it returns either true or false, very simple. And then this one checks to see if a user is admin. Now, this is contestable. Uh, it will only work if we use things in a very specific way. So I think we probably don't need this. It's too complex to be in here to cover all kinds of uh, situations, I guess. So I'm going to remove this one. And this one just gets data from the, um, uh, the user role that we have in the current session. So just grabs, so you just say user, and then you ask for a particular key. If that key is not found, you can specify a default value to return instead, and that's all. So for example, you want the email of the currently uh, logged in user. You just say user, and you say email like that, and then it will return. Uh, whatever column name you put here, it will return. If you want an ID, you will do that. Simple and straightforward. Okay. And then there's pop here. Now pop returns a specific key, just like this one here. Uh, it will return that key, but then it will delete the key afterwards. So that's what pop does. And then all, at this point, will return all the information in the which we have saved in the app in the application now user if you don't specify a key you see the key here is optional if you don't specify the key it return all the the entire row of the user if that's what you want this one returns everything from the app uh, session where whatever we were setting and getting whatever we set in here will be returned as an entire row from here. So you will see how we will use this uh, effectively in in actually doing things. So session, but the namespace is core. So this means whenever you're instantiating this, you do something like session is equal to new session. Normally you would do this and then it's going to instantiate that class. Now you can put brackets if you want, but in this case, because it's in the core namespace, you have to do slash core slash session like that. That way it's very specific. Now there are ways where you can import a uh, namespace. I've ex I explained these things in my OOP uh, playlist, so you can check those things if you want. But from here, what I want is just to save this. So I want to save this in the core and I'll save this one as session.php and save that, bam. Okay, great. So let me close this. I'll close this one as well. Oh, actually, maybe I closed that too early. Then we have this request class that I want us to use as well. So I'll copy some things from the session class like this one. Actually, that's the only thing I need. Uh, okay. So this one is also in the same namespace as session. It's a request. Now request is used for getting things like now, if, for example, you posted something, instead of us having to type something like, uh, we put an if statement, for example, as we normally do, we say if uh, server, and then server uh, request method uh, is equal to post. So instead of having to do this, you can simply do this instead and say request posted, like that. So that will return either true or false. So you would know that something was posted. So it makes things easier to handle. So the quest class, 
Uh, here, the request class returns, this function returns the method that was used, whether it was post or get, if you want to check that. So what you do is say request method, and then it will return the method that was used. So in a situation like this, instead of posted, you can say method is equal to post like that, right? Okay, so posted is the one I was talking about. So this just checks if something was posted. It also checks if there's actual inputs in there. If there's none, it will just ignore that posting. But you can change this if you want. Because, for example, if you put fields that are empty in there, uh, maybe your form has one input and its value is empty, then it won't trigger this because of this part here. So if you don't like that behavior, you can remove this part here. That way it just checks if the server is post and that's good enough. But I added this because I had problems at some point. I don't know what was going on, but it couldn't tell very well what's happening. So this is entirely preferential, what you want to do. And then there's post here. Now post returns... Um, things in the post variable. Let's say, for example, you want uh, the email that someone has posted. You would do this and say request uh, email like that. Okay. This will return... Oh, wait. Sorry. My bad. Let's move this in here. Uh, we'll say post and then we tell it which key we want to get from the post. So this only grabs things from the post variable. Now you can do exactly the same thing to get from the files variable or to get from the get variable if you want to be very specific. Now, if all of your uh, items are just posted to the post, you can just use input instead. So you can say um, email is equal to, and then you do request and then input. And then you tell it, I want from the email input, like so, right? Great. And then all, of course, returns everything from the request super global. The request super global contains all the inputs from get and files and post and yeah, get, post, and so on. So... That's what this does. Now, we can always add more functionality if we want to these things, but this should be adequate. So let me save this one as request capital R.php and save. Okay. So since these guys are in a particular namespace, we can add some other things to namespaces as well. For example, the home uh, uh, thingy here should be in a particular namespace. So namespace should always come first. So these guys are controllers. So we'll put a namespace as controller. Like that. Okay, so namespace controller. So copy that. Every one of these guys should be in the controller namespace to avoid problems. Any classes in here should be in the core namespace. Uh, but for that, we're going to leave them. For now, we'll leave that open. And then here, every model should be in the model namespace. That way, you don't make a conflict with what already exists. So we would do something like that. Now, in order to instantiate this, of course, you have to say something like user is equal to new. Instead of just saying new user like that, you have to put slash model slash user like this. That's better. Or if you don't want to do this, you want, don't want to, if you're doing a lot of this instantiating, there are a lot of model classes that belong to model, you can instead say use model, you can say use slash model like that, okay? So it will use model, and then when instantiating now, you don't need to do that, you can just say user is equal to new user, because you've imported classes that are inside the model namespace. So then... You can instantiate as many classes without having to put model there, if that's what you want. As long as you put use at the beginning, like so. Okay, 
So we will use those things in actual projects and see how they work. So that's about it for now. Now let's see here because the controllers have changed namespaces. So we're going to have a slight problem when trying to load the page. So if I try to load now, it's going to tell me, oh, failed to load, blah, blah, blah. Because look, it's trying to find the file. Um, what's this? Controller slash controller.php failed to open stream. Um, where is this? This is in the init line seven, right? Uh, so what we need to do now is go to the init to fix this problem. So here where we're requiring the file name, we don't want to be including the, uh, the namespace, right? So what I'm going to do is if I now echo this, you will see, let me echo that class name. You will see that class name contains a namespace like controller slash controller. But I just want this part right there. I don't want this part here. So what I can do is just uh, split this guy, split whatever is here, and then just grab the guy at the end like so. So what I'll do is, I'm going to say class name, and so we change the class name, is equal to uh, explode. Now the delimiter is always this way, like that. Now this is a special character here because it actually escapes the next character in line. So we have to put it twice like so. Um, whenever you put a slash and put a character next to it, you're telling it that this is a literal character. It doesn't have any special meaning, but unfortunately this does have a special meaning because it's holding this in. So we put another slash uh, to escape this one. And so this, this slash is escaping this slash. Oh wait, this slash is escaping. This. Anyway, I'm getting confused, but the point is we put two slashes like that to exp to use it will it will um it will use it as one slash when we do this and so we want to explode the class name like so so now this becomes an array with two items uh, this one and this one and we just want this one at the end so what we can do again is duplicate class name and say class name now is equal to end now end is a function that just grabs the last item in an array. So end class name like so. So the file now will be found, but the problem is, okay, so it's looking for controller.php, which is a problem here. This part is fine. Uh, it's going to find the file, but this is only for when we are looking for classes in the models section. So it shouldn't be looking for controllers in here, which means there's a problem in our app section. Uh, so let's go to app here. Now inside app, when we are instantiating and saying this controller is equal to new here, new this controller, we're supposed to provide the namespace as well. Now we know controllers are in the controller namespace, right? So we'll say new controller controller. Now this may create a little bit of a problem. So let's just do this. Let's just say my controller is equal to. Now I want to include the word controller here because that's a namespace. So I'll do a slash like so and say controller like this. And then put another slash and then, oops, so I have to put that slash twice to escape that value and then like that. So now we have controller slash that slash that and then we can use my controller here as one long text there. So yep, hopefully that makes sense. We're just adding the namespace when instantiating it. That's all. So it doesn't go to the init to look for it. Okay, so that didn't seem to do anything at all. Mm. 
That's because it can't find the class, right? Hmm. What is going on here? So controller is equal to new controller. Hmm. Okay, let me do this. Maybe I have to inst instantiate it with brackets like so. Let me try that. No, that doesn't work either. What is happening here? Okay, let me try and put this directly here. Let's see how well that works. I don't remember what I did with my actual project, but... Okay, syntax error. Okay. Hmm. Why is there syntax error? Maybe because of that. So let me put this in a bracket like so. To evaluate it as one item. Ah, finally. There we go. So still, it's looking for controller.php in the models. So maybe the reason it's doing this is not from here, but because controller itself is extended by, where is this? Let's go to model. There's trait model. There's also controller controller, trait controller. Okay, that is fine. If I go to home here, and it's in the controller namespace. Uh, use controller. Okay, so this is where the problem is. Here where I'm saying use controller, right? Um, I should put a slash like so. To tell it that this controller is in the main namespace. So maybe this wasn't a good idea. So what I'm going to do is copy this and go to controller here and put this in the same exact namespace. Controller namespace and this one as well. Let's put this one in the model namespace so that they are all in the same namespace. Okay, that's working. So database is used by models. So there's use database here. So the problem is that we're saying use database, but the namespace, the current namespace is model. So there's no database in the model namespace because database is in the main namespace. It's not in any namespace at all. So if I put this in the model namespace, it would be better because model is what actually uses database. So let's try that. Okay. What's going on now? We are back to this again. Uh, where is controller? Trade controller. Do I use it here? Okay, so model database is in here. Um, now, if you have more problems, you can just put this as a slash like this. When I do this, I'm telling it that this database is in not in any uh, uh, namespace. Or you can directly do that to tell it explicitly where that is coming from. So still there's a controller with a problem. I don't know why. They're in the same namespace here. Let's see, model does not use controller. And this one uses core, which is nice. That core, nice. Okay, so where is the problem? Let me refresh here. Okay, what I'm going to do for now, if you find yourself having these problems, the problem with this is it tries to autoload things, right? So what I'll do is I'll mute this for a second so that it just tells me what the problem is without trying to load it. So I'm going to refresh. So here, fatal error, trade controller not found. Okay, so it tells me now the trade controller could not be found. Where is that? in the home.php on line 10. So let's go to home.php line 10, which is this one. Uh, what's going on? Trade controller not found. So the trait is here where we say use controller. 
So why is the controller not found when we have a controller in the same namespace as this one? Namespace controller, controller. So why can it not find it is the question. Hmm. Anyway, what I can do, whenever you find yourself having these problems, just put the full paths to these things. But I don't want to be doing this. So it's working now. So maybe what I would do is, I think the problem is when I'm saying use controller, the name of the namespace and the actual thing are the same. So maybe that's where the problem is. Hmm. Okay. Uh, maybe let me grab this and put it here as well. Use controller. Use statement with non-compound name has no effect. Okay, so it wants me to put a slash like that. Let's try that. Okay, yeah, it's true. It's just saying uh, it's in the name same namespace, so not really useful at all. Trade controller not found. So it's still not found. Anyway, what I'm going to do then is let's try to call this one main controller like this so i'm going to go back to controller here and change this trait to main controller. i just want it to be different to the namespace okay so let's see if that works okay so it actually did work so that was the problem i think it was getting confused as to which one is the namespace which one is this so then since we've done this uh, trait main controller now we'll be using main controller here so we should do that here as well on the 404 to avoid problems and the home yes there we go okay cool so there we go um things are working now very nice only thing is in the home here i want to try and grab a and say user is equal to new user I want this to to show me if there are any problems with trying to instantiate that class. So that's not found. Why is it looking for control? Oh, because it's in the controller. So here you have to say model slash user like so. Okay, class model user not found. Oh yeah, it's not found because we have to release from the in uh, from this here so no problem in the init and there we go so things are working or what we can do instead if you don't like doing it this way you can simply say use model like that and then it will know that this one it will import all the unexpected token use Okay, the use should always be uh, here, actually, at the top. Wait, no, no, sorry, my bad. It should be here instead. Okay, so let's refresh. Uh, class controller user. It's not working. Why, why, why? Mm, use model. I should say user like that. That's what I'm missing. So you tell it that whenever I say user, I mean the one inside model like that. So let's refresh and then it works. So yeah, so any classes that you want to use without the prefix here, you have to put use at the beginning here. Don't confuse that use with this one. This one is importing another class. This one is importing the namespace. So it can get a bit confusing sometimes, but those are the options or if you don't want that confusion just write the full path like so it's inside models it's in the model um, uh, namespace and then user like that all right so we've added everything namespaces uh, classes here uh, the only class missing is the image class so let's add it all right so I have some code here that I already created for the image class. So the only thing I want to copy is this uh, 
part so that we match with the others the same message so this image one i think let's put this in the model namespace so this one is for image manipulation so as usual we give it a namespace with uh, access denied for direct access and then it's a class image the only function that's here is just for resizing image so there's just one function but we can uh, we might want to use it later or we might want to add more functions later so here what this does is just resize the file so there's a file here and we tell it the maximum size which is 700 pixels if we want uh, or we can put it at 1000 pixels that's up to you how much uh, what the size of the thumbnails you want so you can specify on the fly when you use the resize function so the first thing it does is check what type of file it is so this one gets the content mime type if it's a png then we create image we use this function this is the function we use to create an image resource for gif this one is for jpeg this one is for webp so once we have the image resource we just grab the width and height of that resource so that we know then here we check which one is bigger is it the width or is it the height then we either do this if the width is bigger or the height is bigger we do this so essentially what we are doing is here we check if max size for example let's say the size we want to limit the image is 700 pixels but then we end up giving it a an image with a hundred pixels which is smaller than this the problem is if we leave max size at 700 it will increase the size of the image from 100 pixels to 700 pixels which will actually increase the file size which is not good uh, this is good for when the file is bigger than this and then we reduce it to 700 but when it's smaller then all i'm telling it is to reduce the max size to whatever that small size is same thing here but the actual calculation happens here what we do is we limit the bigger side to the max size and then we reduce the other size with the same ratio that we reduced this one with so that's what we are doing so we're just resizing and essentially what we're doing is creating one image resource and creating a smaller one and then copying the image from the original image resource to the smaller one that's how we are resizing the image so here we are creating the destination uh, image resource which is smaller than the original so we create it here the destination we use the width and height here and then if an image is a png what we do is we we do this to make sure it preserves the alpha channel so that it remains transparent instead of putting a black background so we tell it that alpha blending for this image the destination file is false so that will make sure we don't blend the alpha into the original image and then we tell it that we want image save alpha to be true for this image okay then we copy the old image to the new image right there and then we destroy the original image resource and then here we save appropriately depending on what the mime type is we save a png if it was a gif we save it as such jpeg webp etc if we don't know we just save it as a jpeg and then we destroy the image we remove it from memory and then return the new file name that has the resized file simple and straightforward so let me save this inside uh this one will save inside models so this one will be image dot image dot php and save so it's in the model namespace now if you remember in functions we used this actually the image class and we had named it core so i have to change this to model because we've moved it to the model section uh, yep once we instantiate it that's it so save that let's get back to okay so image php great i'll grab these two uh -huh. then we have one more um uh class that i want us to discuss this is for pagination so this one 
will be in the core namespace. So I'll leave it there. I think it's more suiting there. Let me just delete that and delete that. So this one is for pagination. So I'll put it inside the core instead. So I'll call it pager.php and save. All right. So what this is doing is just creates a pagination at the bottom. So you'll see how we use this because explaining this will be a bit complex, but you see it in use. Otherwise, what we are doing is these are values we can set from outside the class. And then the constructor, once we construct, it just grabs it, everything it needs to grab from the URL, the page, the page number, and then creates links to the next page, the previous page, and all the pages in between with numbers like that to make it more user friendly. And then finally, it displays this. So here it's displaying some HTML. As you can see, these are navigation, you are an ordered list, list items, and it has classes that come with Bootstrap. So if you don't have Bootstrap or anything like that in your system, you can still capture these classes and wait, you can actually change these classes. I put that here so that you can easily change the classes that are responsible. For a list item, what class do you want to use? These are Bootstrap classes. So I made it easy to change them if you want to right here. Now you don't have to type things directly here because these are public items. It means just when calling the pager class, you can actually edit these values as you wish. That way you can have different looking paginations depending where you, uh, on which page you are. All right, so since we've saved this guy, on that note, we have added all the updates that we needed to add let me close all files here for a second. All right, and try to refresh a page just to see if there are any errors or anything like that. And if it's refreshing like this, everything is good. So in case we need another update to add newer things, we're going to do that. But for now, uh, this has improved our MVC system to be more robust and speed up our workflow. So of course you can find the download link to the source code here in the description. And please don't forget when you get to the site, click a few of these, um, click a few of these uh, adverts here uh, so that uh, it helps the website to run itself. That way I can keep making content like this and giving it for free. So. All right, so hopefully uh, this will help you in some way or another to create websites faster. All right, so I'll see you in another tutorial.